for those that were here last Sabbath in the divine service, we saw that love cannot be quenched, yet the love of many grows cold. And what was the reason? Because those many had permitted the pleasures of the world, life's cares and perplexities and the faults of others or their own faults and sins to distract them from receiving that love that is, cannot be quenched. Actually pushed it out of their memory. And so it was that as we are living in these last days, the love of And as a consequence, the church that Jesus addresses in Laodicea, in Revelation, the church of Laodicea, they are lukewarm. Their love has grown to that condition of lukewarmness. No hot love anymore. And so it is that in our time in which we live, we need to admire the love giver. This is what will hold us in that love. To see that love and to let it burn within our hearts. And so it is this hour that we want to spend another beautiful time of worship to admire this law giver, this love giver. Another aspect of this awesome God whom we revere. And um, this aspect is connected in the words of Christ when he spoke in Matthew 24 and said the love of many grows cold. What is the, uh, some other material there that was in the same um, breath that he was speaking there in Matthew 24? We read verse 10. And it says in verse 10 of Matthew 24, And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold. Did you notice here that as Jesus was speaking he said many will be offended <coughs> and because they are offended the natural consequence is there will be betrayal there will be hatred there will be all kinds of interactivities that will cause the love to grow cold because they are offended. And if you recall when we were reading in Matthew 13, 21 last week that those where the seed falls onto the stony ground, there was something that affected these hearers of that seed. Matthew 13 Verse 21, where it said in Matthew 13, 21, <coughs> the parable of the uh, sower and the seed falls onto the stony ground. It says in verse 21, uh, sorry, verse 20, but he that receiveth the seed into the stony place is the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. Offended. Do you know what it means? What it actually is to be offended? What does it mean to be offended? The, um, 
the dictionary term is to feel wounded, to be angry, to be filled with resentment or disgust, outraged. That is what it means to be offended. Wounded feeling, anger, filled with resentment, outraged, disgusted. They will be offended. And because they are offended, they lose their love. The love that has its roots in God cannot be offended. Remember 1 John 4.16, God is love. And I want to spend time with you this morning to contemplate that God who is love that cannot be offended. to understand why it is that love, which is God, does not become offended. God's character, his nature, is love. And how do you actually define that love, that character? There is a statement in the Bible that describes, or rather there is a story in the Bible that describes the character of God. It's there in the Hebrew sanctuary, the mercy seat, is part of the Ark of the Covenant which has in it the Ten Commandments. God sits upon his throne which is typified in the Old Testament as the throne of the law and of love. It's inseparable. And indeed, if you read Review and Herald, March 15, 1906, Review and Herald, March 15, 1906, in paragraph 20, it says, God's law is the transcript of his character. God is love. And those Ten Commandments is a transcript of his character. So, what do, do the Ten Commandments represent? Love. The Ten Commandments are a transcript of his character, which is love. So, if you want to understand God's love, it is the Ten Commandments. something hard to get people's head around because the Ten Commandments are always looked upon as rules and laws. And yes, it is. But we interpret it as a legalistic uh, exercise instead of what God really is in those Ten Commandments. And we want to understand God's character, God's love, the Ten Commandments. Jesus understood, and look what he says in Matthew 22. Remember, Jesus came here to convey to us God's character. In Matthew 22, reading verses 35 to 39, where the lawyer comes to him. <coughs> And, you know, a lawyer, <laughs> he argues in the court. So he comes to Jesus 
and he asks Jesus a question. One of the lawyers, verse 35, one of them which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Now look at what Jesus answers here. Jesus understood the law as the transcript of God's character. Jesus said unto him, what's the most important part of the law? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You have two commandments, two arms. And on the end of those two commandments hang what? Ten fingers or ten commandments. Jesus threw a light upon the mind of this lawyer to show him that the Ten Commandments, a transcript of God's character, are love. And we want to now let that light permeate our minds. The first four commandments in Exodus chapter 20, you have to do, it has to do with loving God. And the last six has to do with loving our neighbor as ourselves. We need to meditate deeply into these laws, into these Ten Commandments, so that we may fall in love with him who is, who's, uh, who has those Ten Commands been transcribed from him as his character. There was, a, there was a, the psalmist in Psalm 119 who meditated upon the Ten Commandments. He meditated on the law. What did he express? Psalm 119, verse 97. Psalm 119, verse 97. Here he is. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Hmm. I don't find people finding the Ten Commandments something to fall in love with. In fact, it puts shudders down people's spine because the law condemns them. But this man of God meditated and found them oh, something to love. Oh, how love. Now when somebody says, oh, <laughs> whoa, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Is it really such a wonderful meditation? It is a transcript of God's character. It is a transcript of his glory, which is his love. And when we fully fall in love with his character, with him, what will happen? What will happen? When you love somebody, when somebody like it is in the world, you know, people fall in love. And when they fall in love with a person, do they have any, do they become offended at all about anything that that person is doing? <laughs> Do 
when you fall in love, you see only good. You never become offended. And that's what the psalmist says. In our scripture reading that we read there, Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace, great peace have they that love thy law. And how much? Nothing shall offend them. Now I want you to ask yourself the question this morning. Do you become offended? You see things around you? Are you is your peace disturbed? Are you offended at different things in the church, in the family, with your husband, with your wife? What does that tell you? I woke up in the morning and the Lord gave me this. Have a look, John. Are you offended? Great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. What did the Lord tell me? If I become offended, I don't love the law. So I must meditate on that law, on that transcript of God's character. Because great peace have they that love thy law. Great peace. There is no internal lack of peace. Nothing will offend me. So, either I don't love the law or I am distracted from meditating upon that law all day from beholding that glory. Wasn't that the case in the mercy seat? There was a glory around the throne. It was the glory of God's character, of the Ten Commandments that were within the throne. It was God's glory. And as you turn to 2 Corinthians 3.18, Apostle Paul described that that glory that was in the Ten Commandments were given to Moses and when Moses came down from the mountain his face shone. And the people had to do, do what? They had to put a veil over Moses' face because they were blinded by that brightness. A veil had to be put before the glory of the law. And here is the description there in 2 Corinthians 3 where he describes that. And then he says in verse 15, But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. What a beautiful meditation here. The veil, when we, turn, when we turn to the Lord, the veil that was needed because it was too bright will be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in the, a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so I want us to take away the veil this morning. I want us to see the glory in the law the transcript of God's character. 
Let us stop to take away the veil from the law and behold the glory in it. The first four commandments. Remember, this is the transcript of God's character. The first four commandments. What do the first four commandments convey <coughs> in reference to God's character? Remember, we are to love God with all our hearts. That's the, the first four commandments. That applies to us. But what about God, who, <coughs> who is the actual lawgiver, that those first four commandments reveal something about his character? What is there in him that pertains to those first four commandments? He first reveals what that means in the first three commandments. Let's go to Exodus 20 and explore God in his love in reference to this. Exodus chapter 20. <coughs> reading verses 2 through to 7. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. What personality of love is revealed here about himself, applying that law of those first four commandments in reference to himself. I am the Lord thy God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. You are not to have any other gods before me. You are not to take my name in vain. You are not to worship other gods. What is actually shining out of this about God's personality and character? Let's just go over to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, verse 5 and 6. Isaiah 45, verse 5 and 6. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. What can you feel streaming out of this? Don't look upon it in terms of the of, of our you know of our attitude toward God at the moment. Look at God's attitude about himself. This is a transcript of his character. What is he displaying here? I'm to be honored. 
Let's read Deuteronomy 5, verse 15. Deuteronomy 5, verse 15. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath. What is God here expressing? Is it not that he has a rightful self-respect. Think about it. Is there anybody else like me? Look what I have done. Look at my power. Look at my capability. What was he describing about himself? He had a rightful self Respect. Is that correct? A rightful self respect. He described his self respect that is requested that you cannot make any other gods and you do not take my name in vain. I am to be respected. How foolish of anybody to go along and worship me through images. You know, who do you think I am? That's the sort of mental exercise for us to consider. Does God have a healthy self-respect? Let's go to the fourth commandment. Because I have done this, I have asked you to keep the Sabbath. We are to admire him on the Sabbath. Let's read there, back to Exodus 20. And we see that the God that is, ex- uh, is revealing here his greatness is the one whom we are to love. Exodus 28 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gate, Why? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Remember that I brought you out of the land of Egypt by a mighty hand. Remember that I am the Creator Remember what I've done at creation. Let's go to creation, to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. And we read there in verse 28. (coughs) Sorry, Genesis 1 verse 31. And then 2 verse 1 and 2. And God saw everything that he had made. Get the picture? God has just been doing a wonderful work. This planet, this jewel of this this consternation. This jewel of this planet that he had created. Behold, I've done a really good job. Do you ever do that when you do it and you do a job and you do a really good job? You feel good about yourself, don't you? Is that wrong? What was the second part? Thou shalt love thy neighbor what? As thyself. 
How can you love your neighbor if you don't have a healthy self-respect? How can you? Half the reason why people have so much difficulty is because they don't respect themselves. And they do all sorts of crazy things. God looked at his creation and he said, wow, this is beautiful. And a proud man would say, stop being proud of yourself. But he had a rightful reason for being happy. It was very good. And the Sabbath was connected with it. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested from the seven, on the seventh day from all his work which he had made and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from his work which God had created and made. He had rested, he had stopped to admire, he had stopped to enjoy the work that he had made. Now he made a memorial of his great work. He was a person who had a healthy self-respect, who had made something beautiful, and now he made a memorial for us to remember that beautiful thing that he had made, that he was the one who made it. Now come to Isaiah 48 and read that, verses 11 to 13. Isaiah 48, verses 11 to 13. <coughs> and here he is speaking of his healthy self-respect. He's speaking about how he had dealt with Israel, not only now, after Egypt, but now many years after in the time of Babylon. Isaiah 48, he says, For my own sake, even for my own sake will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I shall not give my glory unto another. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my call. I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. He's reminding, look at my capability. I will have no one else to take away I will not give my glory to anyone else. This is my glory. This is rightfully mine. And for my sake do I do the things that I do. How careful we must be not to misinterpret God. This is simply God having a healthy self-respect. This is what is God's love? He does love himself. And if you don't have that knowledge of God, you do not know how he loves his neighbor. We'll follow that carefully through. But let me just read here a statement from Daughters of God, page 141, paragraph 3. It says, The Lord has given every one of us a sense of self-respect. God wants us to respect ourselves. If he made us in his image, if he, if he made us in his image, then the self-respect we should have is the self-respect he has. And I read also from our high calling here a very important material for us to take hold of as we look at this character of God. Page 143 of our high calling, I read here in paragraph 4.
It is the privilege of everyone to, uh, to so live that God will approve and bless him. You may be hourly in communion with heaven. It is not the will of your heavenly Father that you should ever be under condemnation and darkness. Now follow that. It is not God's will that we should ever be under condemnation and darkness. Are you listening? If you are under constant condemnation and darkness, how do you feel about yourself? Follow carefully. It is not pleasing to God that you should demerit yourself. You should cultivate self-respect by living so that you will be approved by your own conscience and before men and angels. It is your privilege to go to Jesus and be cleansed and to stand before the law without shame and remorse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. While we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, notice, here's important material here. God, did God think about himself more highly than he ought? Not at all. He only highlighted the things that were naturally his rightful possession. While we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, the word of God does not condemn a proper self-respect. As sons and daughters of God, we should have a conscious dignity of character in which pride and self-importance have no part. <laughs> Get that balance straight. Pride and self-importance must not come in, but we are to have a conscious dignity of character, just as it was displayed by God in the first four commandments. This is God's character. He says, there is none other. I have created, I have redeemed you, I have done this and that and the other. This is an expression of rightful self-respect. And it is from that perspective that we look now how he loves his neighbor. As himself. his neighbor as himself. He created man. How did he create man according to Genesis 1.28? You want to read it? Genesis 1.28? 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Stop to think about this. The psalmist thought about this and he just went, wow. What did he say? Go to Psalms 8. God had made this planet. It was his. He made this planet. And he said to the, his neighbor, the man he created, his neighbor, he said, now you take care of this 
it's yours, it is your dominion. Psalm 8, verses 4 to 6. And before I read verse 4, we go read verse 1. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. He, he just goes, oh, what are you? Oh, this is overwhelming. He says in verse 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And now, a little lower than the angels, what has he done? And hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Did God treat his neighbor as himself? Did he love him as himself? Can you imagine if you've made something that is really beautiful and you've looked upon it and you've made a memorial to make sure it's remembered and then that beautiful thing is given into the hands of your neighbor. Now you look after it and it's your kingdom. Did he love man as himself? Obviously. He trusted him like he would trust his own self to do justice to what he has given him. And in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 45, for our consideration, he was placed, Adam was placed, as God's representative over the lower orders of being. God's representative. Here on earth, Adam represented God. How? It goes on to say, the lower orders, they cannot understand or acknowledge the sovereignty of God. Yet they were made capable of loving and serving man. What did God do? He created these creatures before he created man and he made them capable of not recognizing him as their creator but recognizing man and loving him. Did God love his neighbor as himself? See the character of God here? And then... Having now demonstrated the self-respect of God and seeing that God indeed loves his neighbor as he loves himself, look at the, all the last six commandments in regards to his character toward his neighbor. Remember the fifth commandment. How does that relate to God toward his neighbor? Honor your father and your mother. What is written about Jesus? He, God, became a son of God. That's Psalm 2, verse 7. At the decree that he made, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So the personality of the father and the son being exactly the same, but one demonstrated the attitude of parental submission. That's God's character. His neighbor, his, his own neighbor, his one equal to himself. So as he thought, he thought. And, and this being of the word being God and being with God, the word he became his son then, demonstrates the, f first, the fifth commandment, submission to the other. There it is, in that commandment. Then there comes the sixth commandment. Thou, 
What's it say there? Thou shalt not kill. Does God kill? <laughs> People have told me, the Old Testament is full of God killing. Terrible. Does God kill? All right. Thou shalt not kill. Is this God's character? Does he kill? Well, in Christ Object Lessons, page 84, it says, God does not destroy any man. We've been through this before in our studies. When man is killed, who killed him? Man is destroying himself. And man destroys each other. Sin destroys itself. That's what happened. And that's what will be demonstrated at the very last judgment. That God destroys no man. God is a true personality of that commandment. He loves his neighbor as himself. And then comes the other one. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Does God have such a love towards the church that although it commits adultery, he doesn't? You know this statement very well. How has the faithful city become an harlot? You read in Ezekiel about the harlotry that is described against himself and he keeps on putting up with it. He's not going to let go. Come to Jeremiah chapter 3. He does not commit adultery. Jeremiah 3 verse 14. Here was this, this vow that he had made to Israel. And they, while they broke it, he didn't. Verse 14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Okay, my, my bride, my wife, you've really lost it. You've really gone out and played a harlot. But I'm going to pick you back. I'm going to bring you one of a city and two of a family. And I'm, going, I'm married to you, don't forget. No matter what we've done. Remember, friendship with the world is enmity with God, you adulterers and adulteresses, that's written in James, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. So when God's people are fraternizing with the world, he doesn't commit adultery, they do. He wants them back. Beautiful character. This is God loving. And then Thou shalt not steal. Does God steal? In fact, when he sent Jesus to this earth, look at the experience of Jesus in Psalm 69, verse 4. He, he doesn't want to steal anything of anybody. It's not his nature. So, but, you know, if somebody's got something against him, well, then what does he say? Psalm 69, verse 4. It says, They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me being mine enemies wrongfully are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. He did the opposite to stealing he actually gave to the people something which he never took away from them in the first place. 
God character is transcribed in the Ten Commandments. And here, thou shalt not steal was one of them. And then verse 16 of Exodus 20, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. False witness. Did God ever lie? He cannot lie. And in fact, the scripture says, God who cannot lie has made a double covenant, a double promise. He spoke once in, in, as a promise and then he doubled it with another something that he cannot lie. And finally, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant. Thou shalt not covet. What about that? Did God covet? Philippians 2, verse 6 and 7. What did God do? He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Did he covet the position that he was in? No. He made himself of no reputation. He gave up his position so that he could come close to his neighbor. <laughs> you know, the more I meditate on this, I just want to break out and cry. What a God we have. He is full of love and his Ten Commandments are descriptions of his love. This is God's love for his neighbor. And when his neighbor sinned against him, how did he respond? Remember? Great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Did he respond to the sinner as somebody offended? Let's have a look at Lucifer. Lucifer raised himself against God. And the first thing that God did was show him his love. I want to read it to you. This is one of the most beautiful representations of how Lucifer... Satan himself was given a loving opportunity. He, although he had already gone and sowed the poison against God, uh, God said, okay, this poor creature of mine, this wonderful being that I created in all his glory is really benighted. I've got to show him something. And I'm reading here from... Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36. It's a most wonderful representation of what God did. It said, The king of the universe summoned, we'll just read the first par the paragraph before that, to dispute the supremacy of the Son of God, thus impeaching the wisdom and love of the Creator had become the purpose of the Prince of Angels. So what did God do? the king of the universe, summoned their heavenly hosts before him, that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his son and show the relation he sustained to all created beings. The Son of God shared the Father's throne and the glory of eternal, self-existent one encircled both. About the throne gathered the holy angels, a vast, unnumbered throng. Just imagine, he calls this vast, unnumbered throng to gather around his throne, and Lucifer is among them. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The most exalted angels, as ministers and subjects, rejoicing in the light that fell upon them from the presence of the deity. Before the assembled inhabitants of heaven, the king declared then that none but Christ, the only begotten of God, could fully enter into his purposes. And to him it was committed to execute the mighty counsels of his will. The Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven. And to him, as well as to God, their homage and allegiance were due. In other words, God revealed to Lucifer and the angels that his son, by decree, was the one who created them in the first place. 
And as this was brought out in all its glory, remember God had a healthy self-respect, Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. But in all this, he would not seek power or exaltation for himself, contrary to God's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute his purposes and beneficence and love. The angels joyfully acknowledge the supremacy of Christ and prostrating themselves before him, poured out their love and adoration. Lucifer bowed with them. But in his heart, there was a strange, fierce conflict. Truth, justice and loyalty were struggling against envy and jealousy. The influence of the holy angels seemed for a time to carry him with them as songs of praise ascended in melodious strains, swelled by thousands of glad voices, the spirit of evil seemed vanquished. What's that? The spirit of evil was being vanquished in his heart. God had reached him by doing this. Unutterable love thrilled his entire being. His soul went out in harmony with the sinless worshippers in love to the Father and the Son. There was his opportunity. But when it was all over, he didn't choose to pursue the love that welled up in his heart. He returned to his plan and he became the arch enemy of God. But that's how God deals with the offending material. He is not offended. He reveals the love that he has. Adam, when Adam did that terrible thing of the opposite to what God had told him not to eat of that tree, what did God do? Did he go, oh, I'm never going to talk to that fellow again? Was he outraged? Was he um, uh, offended? No, in the cool of the evening, he came. I want to talk to you. Adam, where are you? <laughs> He knew what Adam had done. He was not offended. He came to show him, to love him, his neighbor, as himself. And how did he show it? Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between the serpent seed and the woman seed. The serpent shall bite the heel of the seed and the seed will bruise his head. And how was that done? In love. Total love. The gospel of Jesus is, a, is, is God's response to sin. He does not become offended. Great love. Great peace have they that love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. As you look at this, isn't it amazing? Then Judas comes along. Judas, that, that disciple, that sneak that was trying to destroy the trust of the disciples. Jesus constantly had to warn him and show him. And there he was, on the evening that he had already decided to, to give Christ over to the Pharisees, to deceive Jesus there. What did Jesus, who knew exactly what he was doing, how did Jesus meet him? It's beautifully portrayed. I want to read it. In Desire of Ages, page 655, meditate upon the love and the unoffended God when sin has taken hold of people. Um, he treats his neighbor as himself. Desire of Ages, page 655. Here is Judas. Very interesting meditation again. It says, um, page 65, paragraph 4, it says, Though Jesus knew Judas from the beginning, though he knew him from the beginning, he washed his feet, and the betrayer was privileged to unite with Christ in partaking of the sacrament. A long-suffering Saviour held out every inducement for the sinner to receive him, to repent and to be cleansed from the defilement of sin. This example 
is for us. When we suppose one to be in error and sin, we are not to divorce ourselves from him. Did you catch that? Did Jesus divorce himself from Judas? No, he did not. When we suppose that one to be in error and sin, we are not to divorce ourselves from him. By no careless separation are we to leave him in a, a prey to temptation and drive him upon Satan's battleground. Say, are you listening? Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Have you been sinned against by somebody? And you really feel... Offended. What was that? Outraged. Angry. Wounded. How many in their wounded state and offensive, offended nature will divorce one another? Will separate from one another and drive each other into Satan's temptations. Jesus didn't do that. In fact, when he washed Judas' feet, look at this beautiful statement here. Jesus knew it and here he was. Jesus alone could read his secret. Jesus could read his secret, Judas' secret. Yet, he did not expose him. What was that? He did not expose Judas. Jesus hungered for his soul. He felt for him such a burden as for Jerusalem when he wept over the doomed city. His heart was crying, How can I give thee up? The constraining power of that love the constraining power of that love was felt by Judas. When the Saviour's hands were bathing those soiled feet and wiping them with the towel, the heart of Judas thrilled through and through with the impulse then and there to confess his sin. Same as Lucifer. God himself may be hurt and grieved by what sinners have done, but while he is grieved, he is not angry. He is not offended. He understands and he extends a love to treat others as he would love them to treat him. Isn't that the golden rule? To treat others as I would like to be treated. This is what God demonstrated. The whole human race, he loved, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What else could God have done? That's all he could do. Why are people going to be destroyed? He didn't destroy them. They will destroy themselves. There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. So there is another beautiful ex ex example in the Hebrews. The Hebrews said, everything that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And then what did they do? They broke the commandments. He said, okay, okay, I'll make another covenant now. I'm going to put my law in your hearts. And how did he do that? by bringing Jesus into the planet to put the law of love, those Ten Commandments, into the heart. Don't you admire him? Is he not a wonderful God? Is not his law wonderful? Away with the legalistic mentality. The veil is removed as you gaze upon this character. 
It was never part of God's nature to be legalistic. Never. Instead, when his law of love was broken, his love covered a multitude of sins. Are you prepared to open your heart to that? 1 Peter 4, 8. Let's read it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Here is the message to the church. Above all things, what? Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. What's that? Can I do that? I can, if I am in love with God's law. Strange contradiction of terms. The law says, you've just sinned. You've got to get punished. No. It's the law of love. Do unto my neighbor as I would want them to do to me. It's the law of love that says, I will love and respect myself enough so that I will treat my sinning brother or sister in the love that God has. when you have such a love in front of us as we have contemplated here and as what the psalmist said, it is my meditation day, every day, all day. Can anything offend you? Does, does it permit any offense in you? You know, when things rankle in my heart, I cannot exercise that rankling in my heart. Because I look at the God, love of God and I say, what, me? Me? React in, 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 in a determined offense men mentality? Momentarily, yes, it happens. It rankles there. But it's not going to retain, be retained there because I can't. I look at the love and how dare I. What is it to be offended? Wounded feeling. Anger, filled with resentment, disgust, outraged. Did God ever demonstrate that? The law is a transcript of God's character. He fulfilled his part. So all of us, we who may fall in love with that God, with that law, are to do our part, as he did. I don't need to lay any exactions on anybody around me, none whatsoever. I just kindly do what he did. I treat everybody the way God treats them. And when they sin against me, what do I do? I do just what God did. Simple. And that's my responsibility. Isn't that the description of Judas, of, of uh, Joseph? He was maligned, he was mistreated, but he always only responded in doing his job right. And by doing his job the way that God wanted him to do it, the most disastrous influences of his brothers was recovered. How we have lost sight of a loving God. Great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Amen. Let us kneel in prayer. <coughs> loving eternal Father, Indeed, we kneel before you and own that we have not grasped this beautiful love in the past as we should. We thank you again for giving us this opportunity here 
to acknowledge, to own up, to take responsibility, and to permit your amazing treatment of us to behold that treatment and be changed into the same image. Father, forgive us for neglecting to keep you ever before us. Forgive us for the things we have been doing according to this very hymn that we have not known thee as we ought and feared thee and loved thee as we ought or serve thee. And now, Father, when shall we know thee? And we realize that, Father, that all these things that we have failed in can overwhelm us to an extent that we will not respect ourselves. But we thank you that you respected us. And we see that because you respect us, that you love us as you love yourself, that you came down in the presence of Jesus himself and demonstrated this amazing love. And you are still there in the work of the judgment before it's all too late. Lord, as we've just been singing, may we day by day prepare to see thy face and serve thee there. We thank you, you are giving us our opportunities. Like you have given every angel, every human being throughout history. We thank you that Jesus does not judge us as he himself has said. He does not judge us. He does not come to condemn us. If our heart condemn us, you are greater than our heart. Help us to open our heart, to let you totally take over, to know that we can expose our inner soul to you and show a love that is portrayed in those beautiful Ten Commandments. Once again, forgive us. And help us now to take hold of this work without delay because we have seen that we can be saved by your love. As the veil has been removed from the law, help us to cease legalistic expectations but show the character that you are, the glory manifested. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.